Ladies and gentlemen, this is Adam Kokosh here in Las Vegas, Nevada. I'm here with my good friend Morgan Rockwell, who I've known going back to his first blockchain-based business, Bitcoin Kinetics, back in 2013, 2014, when I was living in L.A. and he was in Northern California. Got to visit his shop up there where they were doing the first mechanical implementations of cryptocurrency receivers to power things like washing machines and I'll, I'll give him a chance to give a brief summary but he's someone who's been in the blockchain space for many many years to hear him talk about some of the stuff I mean goes over my head but it is really awesome to hear how he's engaged and connected to what's going on in a very very practical way and as such he's a Bitcoin trader and just on February 9th of this year was arrested because he was set up on a trade where he was selling $9,000 worth of Bitcoin. And the person who was making that trade with him said that the money involved had something to do with a marijuana hash oil extraction machine. And because that was illegal under federal law, they had to set him up. Now, excuse me for the long introduction because Morgan has, has plenty to say about this. But I want to point out the connection here with the recent trial of Thomas Costanzo, uh, who you might know as Morpheus Titania, uh, under similar circumstances in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, and being set up on various federal operating and unlicensed money transmi bi transmitting business and money laundering and, and charges like that. And the setup is insane here. So I'm going to give Morgan a chance to, to tell a story but uh, just be thinking, I have to set this up properly. I want people to be able to learn from this story, especially for people who are in the blockchain space who have this kind of exposure. So Morgan, if you could just first give us your, should I just give you the mic? You. <laughs> All right, well, I wanna make sure that you at least cover, you know, first give us a couple minutes of, of your credentials and your background in the blockchain space. Okay, so um, I started Bitcoin Kinetics in 2011 in California, which was a first company in the United States to use the word Bitcoin in a company title. And we tried to create the first machines that used Bitcoin and, uh, it was a very tr trying experience to bring Bitcoin to corporate America and bring Bitcoin to other manufacturing partners like Intel and Google and companies like that. So it was a learning experience more than anything. And um, in the process of doing that, I had a lot of companies turn down our products because they were afraid of Satoshi or the legal status of Bitcoin. So I formed Bitcoin Inc. here in Nevada and formed a corporate entity to t try to put Bitcoin in a corporate sense that would be trustworthy to these companies. And in doing so, I've kind of put myself as Bitcoin in human form in this state to present it to the governments, the Chamber of Commerce, the schools. And along that whole process for the last seven years, I've been living on Bitcoin full time, buying and selling Bitcoin, eating with Bitcoin, getting paid in Bitcoin and paying people in Bitcoin. So I was a prominent user of local Bitcoins, which is the f biggest over-the-counter market where you can buy and sell Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer with people. And I was found on this website by undercover Homeland Security agents, and they found my contact information and set up a trade with me while I was up there in North California where you met me, sleeping in a tent in the Mendocino National Forest <laughs> because uh, we lost our facility in wildfires. We lost a lot of property and the neighbors evacuated so I was actually up there trying to find new property and um, I needed to sell some Bitcoin to kind of evacuate from the fires it's to pay for a bus to pay for food and so I went on local Bitcoins and put an ad up and I was found by these undercover agents because I had a large amount of trades I've done over the last nine years under that account which is actually my band name Metabolo so like you know how Morpheus has his name as his internet persona, my internet persona is Metabolo, and in this indictment that I am now dealing with, it has the name that my mother gave me, the name that I grew up with, and my band name. So it definitely makes me look like a pseudonymous, anonymous character, and it also makes me... So to kind of, I could just be clear, because I've known him from these various entities, and he's got two different Twitter accounts. With, it's like yeah. the layers of identity. That's and my band, you know. Do you want to tell people your legal name, though, so my they know how to reference your documents? My legal name is Morgan Rock Coons, because my dad is uh, Michael David Coons, and my mom is Penny Jean Rockwell. So I had both of their last names combined. So I went by Morgan Rockwell my whole life, because I was raised by my mom. 
And when I had to get my driver's license, I found out that they were merged together on the birth certificate, which I didn't even know. For he didn't know his real name until he went to get a driver's license. And, and Metzabalo is like my internet name to keep my identity safe for years, but it's also my band name. So it's no different than Eminem and Slim Shady and Martha, Marshall Mathers, you know. And the the weird situation to me is that that identity was kind of picked on because it was the trading identity. And at the same time, I'm a physical person that people know my face and name in the Bitcoin community, which is kind of a rare thing. Everyone loves to be anonymous and not show who they are. I've tried to go the other route to make sure that there was someone that corporate America, the military, um, different councils and city governments could call on the phone and say, hey, tell us how Bitcoin works. Because I'm a teacher and I teach kids about Bitcoin, but I've also taught the military and I've taught council members how Bitcoin works to make sure that they aren't doing stupid things and making Bitcoin look bad. And um, I mean, I formed Bitcoin Inc. and officially became CEO of Bitcoin under that DBA doing business as here in Nevada so that I can call myself the CEO of Bitcoin and advertise myself as the CEO of Bitcoin. <coughs> and I joined the Chamber of Commerce and I helped contribute to Nevada being tax exempt from Bitcoin now. So that's the way that process works in the old government world is having someone actually do the footwork and going to courtrooms and going into city council meetings like you've done before. And I feel like it's almost a catch 22 blessing that this kind of federal case is happening to me and not some innocent 18 year old trader that's not as proficient in knowledge about Bitcoin or po politics at that matter. Yeah, it now, I want to just point out that this is happening to eight, eight people. people. You were the ninth, yeah. right? Can you explain yeah. what what that represents and, and, and what well, that what demographic is? Is that the eight other people's warrants were sealed. And I have worked with intelligence and military people. So my experience is that when I found out that this was happening to me, I contacted all of my connections and found out that I had a sealed warrant. And when this went to the arraignment for the first time, which was a few months ago, the warrant became unsealed. The other eight people's warrants are not. And then the only way that I was really f exposed to those other cases was um, Theo at Abolish the Bit License, who is fighting for the Bit License in New York to get abolished. That's Theo Chino. Yeah, yeah. And so he came to my arraignment and he presented me with a little bit of that knowledge and showed me that. Well, this is this is a guy who who people should know, someone who is doing some good organizing, standing up for people facing crypto related abolish. charges. Do, do you know his website? You want to yeah, give him a plug here? Abolishthebitlicense.org, I think, is what it is. Abolishthebitlicense.org. And if you can't find it from that, Theo T H E O Chino, just like yeah. you think C H I N O. And he's basically shown up at all these um, court cases, lawsuits. He's kept all the legal uh, issues regarding Bitcoin uh, documented. And that's kind of helped me realize that um, I'm not alone in this kind of battle with the federal government. Because at one point, I was teaching the U.S. military to understand Bitcoin in my, my Marine father's sense that if the military knows how this works, they use it, it'll be safer than them not using it and hating it. So... Just like the microwave oven and, you know, the TV, these technologies need to be embraced by the military before they go to the commercial markets. So well, hold on. I want to get back to these test cases, though, because that's really what they are, right? They're doing one in every district. And I'm in the southern district, so I know that they've done these exact same charges on these eight other people in every district of all corners of the U.S. And it's really interesting to see that with, with Morpheus, they, you know, Morpheus is someone who does a kind of similar thing to what you're talking about, making, uh, you know, Bitcoin friendly, but he does it on a, like on an individual scale, and he's, he's you know, always, you know, representing in the Phoenix area so people know, and he's getting people really involved like that. And I, I think there's something to that, like why they put the investment into that. And this is this is the other thing is is, is that just think about the the tax dollars that are wasted in setting these cases up. It is, it was I mean, every every yeah. Years. I was we, you know, this was happening for many years since 2014 that I was told that I was being uh, observed, and yeah. these trades happened in yeah. 2015, and now we're in 2018. So the manpower, the amount of people being spent, paid to follow, spy, investigate, is is it's just insane to me how much money was spent on not just me, but these eight other people. And one of my friends, who's a very good lawyer in the federal government, he told me that 
one of the big arguments they're going to do here is the interstate commerce clause, which is from like the 1850s, the Civil War uh, law that came after that to make sure states aren't trading across state borders. And they're going to try to basically say that Bitcoin's network broadcasts to nodes across state lines and country lines. And even though someone could trade Bitcoin with a person right in front of them, that violates the interstate Civil War 200-year-old law because you're trading ledger and transaction data across wires. All right, so I, I want to get back to the specifics of your case so people know like what you're facing at this point. You have just two charges, correct? Well, they, there's three, and, and all these other people were charged the same first two charges, which is money laundering instrument and operating a money service business without a license, which in my opinion is bullshit because a person could trade Bitcoin or sell their personal property, but operating a business that law needs to say that you're an actual business doing this and uh, the third charge that I have is asset forfeiture because they want to take everything I have and um, these well, wait, what is the actual charge asset forfeiture asset is forfeiture. not a charge that's the third charge that's listed asset forfeiture so I, I don't understand that because like in Morpheus's position he was charged with a felony ammo position and I've never you know had any kind of crime before this so there what I was told is that these third charges are the ones that back up the first two that enforce them. And since they think I made money on this nine grand, that they want to take the money from that and maybe argue that all the money I've made in the past should be taken because of money laundering instrument, which is really Bitcoin is being charged, not just me. Bitcoin is being labeled as a money laundering instrument. I'm not the instrument. Bitcoin is the instrument. Right. So you have a hearing coming up on the 30th. What is that? This is, to my knowledge, the first hearing with the judge that could actually be the judge in the trial. So this is the hearing that will, I think, decide if the trial goes through and when the trial happens and the whole proceedings on how that's going to happen. Because I've been to three arraignments and an a revocation of bond hearing and, and they're not letting you smoke they're not letting you smoke right pre-trial conditions say i'm in a federal case not allowed to consume cannabis because it's federally illegal right. not allowed well, to well, leave I just, I just want to point out that this is like a whole other punishment in and of itself going through this whole legal process jumping through all these bullshit hoops but you have a unique suffering to endure here yeah. as a medical marijuana patient and i know we say you're we had to talk about this because you, you were explaining to me earlier that you finally become sick of the smell of marijuana, like offended by it because of, of the temptation. Well, it's like I have multiple sclerosis, and I, I had a seizure when I was 16. I went to Children's Hospital, Ronald McDonald's neurologist, and they told me to smoke weed under neurological uh, tests and neuro, uh, neurologists adv advice to consume THC, which would cause the myelin sheath, the coating around your nerves, to grow back. And uh, white blood cells attack your nerves and MS and strip the coating off. So THC causes the damage to heal. So for 16 years almost, I've been consuming THC every day and I've had no problems. But now it's been 85 days without THC or cannabis of any kind. And I have to do random piss tests to prove that. I'm not allowed to leave the state under any conditions other than trial. I'm not allowed to own a firearm, and I'm also not allowed to commit city, state, or federal crimes of any kind. So if I cross the street and jaywalk, I go to jail. So I, I'm under these pre-trial conditions, which is horrendous in its own fact, but that's just to make sure that I make it to the trial without being in a detention center, which they tried to revoke my bond over some made up bullshit about piss tests being off and and I won that revocation of hearing but now we're going to actually go to the real trial and, and if that yeah. happens it's going to be a long process so just to demystify a little bit of that process for y'all by by contrast with Morpheus he was held he was arrested yeah. in April like a year ago and the yeah the bond was uh just it was not an option for him uh, but he had a rap sheet like like mine. You know, he's been a civil disobedience activist for many years. So. Ticket in my life. Yeah. So that's the, this is normal. This is not like some crazy thing that's different about his case than Morpheus's. And you're just really fortunate to be in that situation. And you're going to go to a jury trial. You're going to actually have to plead this case in front of a jury. So I still don't know if this trial is going to happen because, in my opinion. Your it, lawyer could get this dismissed pre-trial because it's such a flimsy. It like yeah. the 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 idea of the a machine, of money, machine to process THC and it being under ten. Like it is just, 
it's it, it's kind of a stretch. There's so many arguments where your lawyer can say, "That's just a waste of and time. Get this out of here." Lose. So they yes. want to make sure they have a good. They've got Morpheus as a test case already, where they've gotten a conviction. Yeah. And to point this out, he was convicted on five counts. And so there's there's at least one obvious lesson here. And with Morpheus, we saw from his trial that there were at least, and, and you know that they, if they have three agents testify from three different federal agencies, yeah. they've got way more who have been tracking the victim for, you know, like in your case, it was years. And, and, and you, we don't even know how long it was in the case of Morpheus. But there might be even more like piled up that are about to cascade out. But in his case, he's been in jail for a year and he um, he's 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 he just was convicted on five counts. He's going to have a chance for an appeal. But it is a, you know, a really brutal situation that he finds himself in. And and I, I think in Morgan's case, they, they really mess with the wrong guy who's in a position from the outside to, to make a big impact, to bring a lot of attention well, to this one case. one thing that I said, I am kind of blessed as a catch-22 that this happened to me because I think I was raised properly to handle this situation. And I know there's some people that um, would have given up already. And I feel that if Bitcoin is going to have this kind of legal battle in its history, it needs to be verbally defended physically defended and I've done enough of the corporate work that I have articles of incorporation I have the Church of Satoshi I have patents on Bitcoin and I have military credentials now that I've presented to the Army Training and Doctrine Command how to use Bitcoin so I feel that I am the best candidate to protect Bitcoin in the courtroom compared to like a 20 year old that sold a joint for Bitcoin that would plead guilty and then the same case would go through which makes me suspect that they're probably going to try to make this one go away quietly. But if they don't, I know you're going to have a lot of fun with it at trial. So the, the, the hard lesson for a lot of people to accept in this then is that if you're doing anything with cryptocurrency that has your name anywhere near it, you have to just like sterilize that from well, the rest of your life because you that, anything that could be illegal the they could associate could have even been the only reason because it could come down to an IP address it could come down to a Mac number That's true. it could come down to um, a physical address where money was sent to and whoever owns that address like because, or drugs because I mean my they put my band name in the indictment and that was just my name on local bitcoins but they didn't really use that they just contacted me from there so contacting a pseudo name and sending a pseudo name money for pseudonymous bitcoin is really weird on identity and it's really weird on the legality of who's getting what and um where's the proxy and where's the money actually going and who's it going to is a weird thing because they could have just begin they could have been trading with a robot you know and that's the reality is i've built a lot of ai and a lot of robotics and if a robot goes on Twitter and threatens to kill you, is it liable or the guy that made it? Well, if a robot trades Bitcoin with an undercover agent, <laughs> am I liable because I made it? Or like, it comes down to some really weird legal precedents using yeah. Bitcoin and identity. And since there's no bank, no social security number, no no identifying information in that transaction, does this go across the entire Bitcoin network and precedents? And then. It comes down to things like the Lightning Network, where we can send 100 million transactions a second over these Lightning Network channels. Who's the custodial of this Bitcoin? Are they going to be in trouble now because of this case? Because they're holding Bitcoin temporarily and moving it across yeah. different lines. That's what I really think about is what this legal snowball rolls into and how to prevent it from getting worse. Well, I'm pretty optimistic. I mean, even like in the worst case scenario, if, if you have to do time, the precedent for this... It, you know, it's it's not like you're facing a Ross Ulbricht kind of charge where you're going to do decades or multiple life to sentences. Court now, maybe. And yeah, well, we can we can hope, but uh, there there's a lot of hope for this because ultimately Bitcoin is continuing Bitcoin to take off. This, no matter what, yeah. I, you know, you know it's, the, 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 I mean, the cat's out of the box, I right? I do, and no, my health is being attacked, but it's also like I know I do important work for Bitcoin, and if there's some government state actor out there that hates bitcoin that's the way that they think to stop this from happening and it all backfires it all, it's only going to accelerate it yeah, it's going to make more people want to use bitcoin and it's going to get smarter and it's going to create more uses for a lot of the privacy technologies on top of bitcoin yep. and and i think that the government either is fully aware of what they're doing by trying to 
create case law for Bitcoin in a good or a bad way, or they're so naive that they're just shooting in the dark and this is going to create a situation they don't even like even even more. You know, they're going to make more people aware of Bitcoin because of these cases. And that might be the opposite effect that they wanted. I always say never ascribe to a conspiracy what can be adequately explained by incompetence. And it's been said by many wiser people in, in many other ways. But in this case, it is a little disturbing because there is a conspiracy here. We know it. Every one of these cases is a conspiracy to screw someone over who's innocent by charging them with victimless crimes. And what if it comes down to the RICO Act upon all of us Bitcoiners? That's the scary thing, that conspiracy gets argued in court. <laughs> On, on the Bitcoin network, and that's the, the kind of things I think about. I'm here in Las Vegas where many men in history have been charged with the RICO Act. So what is the idea that Bitcoin is now on that level on the legal front? And, of course, they want to associate it with that as well as yeah. much as possible. So I, I just want to point out that we should not underestimate the incompetence here as well, because no matter what, there's plenty of government incompetence to go around. So finally, Morgan, aside from sharing this video, sharing your story, what can people do to help your case? Um, don't ever use an over-the-counter trading platform again. Um, there's new things like decentralized exchanges. You know, There's new ways of buying and selling bitcoin on tools like cash app or or you want to plug an exchange that you like i mean i've honestly been living on the cash app for the last six months because it's become a very convenient way to receive money and turn it into bitcoin immediately and use it on a card and in, in the places where they don't accept bitcoin but i'm also in the state where bitcoin is tax exempt so i can do all that all day long without taxable events so i would just um promote Nevada itself and tell everyone to move to Nevada in the tax-free Bitcoin cryptocurrency is all tax exempt here. We have over our uh, 60 Bitcoin ATMs in the state. There are casinos and strip clubs and soon to be golf courses that take Bitcoin. So having the, the Petri dish environment where it's used is probably going to be the safest state environment legally. And, you know, I know a lot of people don't care about or like the idea of the state. But now that the federal government is literally picking on Bitcoin, Nevada is the safest state in the union in regards to Bitcoin. Thank you to YouTube for hosting this video and for being an essential part of human progress by making video hosting available worldwide to everyone on the internet. However, the next phase in human progress is here with Steemit.com and their video hosting alternative blockchain-based solutions, including DTube. And you can find that through Steemit.com as well as my own page there, at Adam Kokesh. This is a decentralized blockchain-based social media network that pays you fairly for your content. Already, I'm regularly making more there with a single post than I do from an entire month on YouTube. So please join us on the next frontier of the information revolution at steamit.com. And if you want help getting a leg up there, I'm happy to re-steam your posts and make sure that no one is starting from scratch. Just email me one of your favorite posts at adam at thefreedomline.com and we'll share it on my feed.